the Mavs, you know, when you, when, to me, when you have a front facing owner like Mark Cuban, whose profile is obviously through the roof, then uh, I think folks rightfully assume that, that his fingers are in everything, but it's a lot more complicated than that with this group. You got Donnie Nelson has been there a long time in the front office. Rick Carlisle, you know, wins that title uh, about a decade ago and is now one of the longest tenured coaches in the league. And, and so a lot of familiar faces. Bob was not a familiar face. He's not somebody who the mainstream fans are aware of. Take us through the, the piece a little bit. When did you start thinking that his influence and his situation was worth exploring? And, uh, and what did you learn? Right. I, I think the idea that the, the front office um, has not lived up to, to Luca's end of the bargain, if you will, like he's ready to win now. And you saw in game seven, I, I felt like the Clipper series was an indictment on the, the job they've done. You know, he had what forty six and fourteen, and the game wasn't even close at the end. Kawhi Leonard was subbing out because you know the game was in hand. The idea that the the front office has has been an issue is 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 something that's been there. And I started hearing that there were, there were specifically issues within it um, months ago, and all around the league. I mean, I think I think league and and team and and there's a lot of people just concerned with the with the direction it was taking, with the idea that you know that that this Luca timeline is now and nobody wants to look back in a few years and say, we messed that up. Um, that we, we annoyed the, you know, a generational player, uh, who they were fortunate enough to draft, um, wanted to draft, but, but certainly fortunate in, in some ways as well. No, nobody, nobody wants to look back on a, on, on in a moment like this, on an opportunity for a team that has not won a playoff series since the 2011 title and, and, and say, man, we messed this up too. And now Luca wants to go somewhere else. Now he now he wants out. Now now he, you know, is just not satisfied with the with the team with the roster being built around him. And and I think that's that's where a lot of this was built and based off of. And it, it just kind of it, it kind of went from from there over time as the you know it, it became clear that you know there were so many competing interests and there was you know just confusion uh, about how the league even viewed the Mavericks front office who actually held power. Who was the people to talk to for this or that? You know, it was it was a a consistent um, you know concern and and buzz that was building and building and building over time, and 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 so that's that's when I really tried to start reporting this as as well as I could. Um, I talked to a lot a lot of people um, throughout the league. You know, there was uh, eventually you know people on the team uh, who who shared these concerns and 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 had their own uh, you know details and and, and things to share. And and that's that's you know kind of the the genesis of of the story and and how it led to the the piece that we published this morning. Just a quick uh, or a couple of quick uh, overarching thoughts for me, and then I'm I would definitely want to hear Fred and, and Slater's take on this. Um, for one, it speaks to Luca's greatness early on that you know that this is even a story because as we reported, you know he is widely expected to sign that supermax extension but you know his talent is on the kind of level where if you are trying to replicate a Dirk Nowitzki type experience then you are he's so good that you're already thinking about the next contract and so it's funny even as I looked at our piece I'm thinking if I'm a reader I'm confused like wait you said he's signing so what am I worried about it's like well because that's when it, when a guy's this good you got to think about the long road the other thing is that um you know, I, and again, I'm admittedly kind of shamelessly patting our company on the back and our platform, I guess, is that like these types of people in some form or fashion exist with every single team. And I love the fact that, you know, that we so routinely try to get into some of these things. You know, if you ask other teams about trade rumors or different things around the league, other teams are constantly trying to figure out who's actually making the call, who actually has the juice. And there are these somewhat mysterious characters throughout the NBA that, that even the executives themselves are trying to learn about because they don't ever want to waste any time on the phone with somebody who claims that they're making the calls and they're not. And so in that regard, you know, I mean, I already got some feedback today from around the league where folks were, were surprised that Bob hadn't been front and center even earlier. So again, great job on the piece. Fred and, and Anthony, uh, I don't know who wants to dive in, but Again, you guys have been through this with the teams you cover, but but in general, kind of how did uh, how did the piece and the situation hit you? Well, one of the interesting parts about it is like it, you know from reading it, it's not just a front office thing, right? This bleeds into the coaching staff and Carlisle and and line, you know lineup decisions, and um, I'm just 
I, you know, how much is that a clash? Would you say? I mean, uh, and it, it seems you know through through you know, reading your guys' reporting, like there's been tense moments with Rick and and questions about his future with Dallas and what at this point, what is he like the second longest, third longest tenured coach in in the NBA? Right. Yeah. Third, third, it's Popovich. And then he's essentially tied for a second with, uh, with Spolstra. Yeah. It's look, it's no secret that, that Luca and and Rick have clashed in, but it heads. This has been reported on ad nauseum. We certainly added reporting to that, to those facts and, and to the idea that, that Rick is somebody who, whose role is, is being considered, is, is being looked at. Um, I I don't, I don't think, and, and we say in the piece, we're not questioning his, his acumen as a, as a basketball coach, he's, he's clearly very good strategically, but you know, the idea that, you know, if you're not going to get along with the best player, if, if, if the, if the best player is someone who is not routinely listening to you, um, yeah, that's a concern that, that, you know, that adds to this entire dynamic that, you know, you, you need to, you need to be sure you're doing what you need to do to make sure that you maximize the Luca timeline. And if that if that comes to coaching, like that's also a concern. That's something that you have to to consider. You have to view, and you have to think about. All right, you know what? You know, is, is this is this relationship uh, manageable or tenable going forwards? Is this something that you know needs to be addressed? And I think that's that's where we tried to land on the piece. You know, it wasn't. You know, all things considered, you, you read the piece. I, I don't think you should come away from it thinking that that Carlisle has been the problem on this team per se. You know, I, I, I again, he is tactically, I, I think he's consistently gotten more out of a out of a roster and a group of players over his entire tenure. But if if, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, if if he doesn't clash with with the star player, even if he's tried to openly and accurate, you know, very clearly tried to adapt his style and, and, and how he coaches his team to build around him. You know, are, are are you certain that's that's still working? Are you certain that he's done enough to to make that a a reasonable and you know productive relationship going forwards? And I think that's mostly what got called into question and in, throughout the reporting and in the publishing of this piece. And and I think that's probably the takeaway that that should be had after reading this. So so on that note, we've we've all covered different kinds of front offices, and I'm sure we've all heard stories from around the league about anywhere from meddlesome front offices to front offices who just let the rest of the guys in the organization do their thing and whatever they want to call it. They're, they're laissez-faire, they're, you know, uh, co- collaborative tends to be a, a very buzz buzzword that we hear around the league all the time, right? And when you hear stories about front offices that are meddlesome, it's almost always coming from the top. And you often hear pushback, you know, a front office will come in and say, you got to play this guy more. And the coach says, no, here's why I'm not playing this guy. And there's often pushback. And sometimes it's a very healthy pushback. And that's a great, that's a great kind of clash that you actually want because that's where ideas stem from. And other times it turns personal or unprofessional or whatever you want to call it. What I'm curious is Rick Carlisle is known as being a guy who wants to coach the way that he wants to coach. And unlike a lot of guys who want to coach the way they want to coach, he has the resume to back it up. He's coached numerous NBA teams. He's had success in numerous destinations. I mean, I don't know if the average fan realizes how rare it is to be a coach with a ring. Like so few coaches around the league have actually coached teams to a ring. And he did it uh, and has consistently coached good teams and been well-respected around the league. How does he react when the person who's meddling is not even just somebody from the front office telling him this is the better way to do your job. Here are the rotations. Here's how you should be coaching this situation. When that person isn't just from the front office, but but is also somebody who is, you know, technically not in charge of the front office, is technically not the highest up person in and, the hierarchy. And tied to ownership too, which is always its own thing. I mean, Tim's the expert there. My quick response to that question, Fred, would be that for one, I mean one thing I've, I've learned about Rick over the years and heard in spades and, and doing reporting for this piece is that, I mean, to quote the story when we had an anonymous quote, uh, you know, the R rated version was that he's adaptable as a motherfucker. Like, and it made me laugh because it just, it kind of gets to the heart of how Rick has had this ability to read the room 
with the Mavs um, all the way through his tenure. So he, you know, had some friction with Jason Kidd. And like we had in the piece, you know, his assistant coaches had to go to him and essentially say, you know, Dirk is all in on Jason. You're not winning this one. Fall in line. Don't be so controlling. You know, and, and he did and then win a championship. Well, you know, then we saw the opposite of that with Rajon Rondo. That was laid bare. We saw when when Carlisle, you know, saw that that uh, that he could win that battle. And he kind of put Rajon out there publicly at the time. This one with Luca. But we've been hearing since last year that, that Rick was well aware, like you're not winning this with Luca. And, and by when I say winning this, I simply mean, you know, picking and choosing your spots on how stubborn you're going to be, whether it's play calling, whether it's timeouts, whether it's, OK, you're doing this thing and that thing that are irritating Luca. Rick then gets to decide how much he cares. Well, if it wasn't Luca, then he doesn't care if it's, you know, Tim Hardaway Jr. It's a different response. And. So, I, but to your specific question, Rick knows that, that, that Bob is obviously empowered by Mark and he is, you know, essentially part of the front office. And, and that's where Mark is, I think, such an interesting guy in general, because, you know, he's got these people running his organization and, and like a level of stability that you don't see very often in the NBA with the Donnie Nelsons and the Carlisles around him. But then, you know, you have a little bit of an unorthodox approach with Bob and somebody that he clearly trusts and wants to be part of the decision making process. Um, so that's kind of how I see all that. Right. And we, we've reported that players felt like, you know, these these rotations that were being set up and, and shared were rigid to the point that it, it prevented them from being as good as they could be, that, that, that they could be, you know, they, they were frustrated. There was a lot of frustration within the locker room and it's stemming from that. Uh, we didn't. Uh, I'll note that we did not report that that Rick and Bob had a bad relationship. Um, as far as I know, you know, like you could probably infer to some degree that you know if if Rick was really being, you know, you know his hand was being held in some ways that he he wouldn't like that. You know, we we all know Rick Carlisle, but I also think that Bob in some ways is very good at his job and, and that he has good smart ideas about how to manage stuff. The problem becomes. If if it's so direct and it's it's so unflexible, unrigid, um, or or is unrigid, I suppose, and you know, it, to the point that that players feel like their roles are are not even being assigned from the the person who is you know in charge of coaching them. Yeah, that's going to be an issue. That 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 has been an issue in, in the locker room, and, and and that's 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 you know the the real concern that I think I took away from from that specifically is is just how it. You know how these, you know, overarching decisions. Even even if Rick is someone who's like, oh, this makes sense and this is smart, and I am going to do it this way, because Rick absolutely is someone who you know has a you know he's really embraced I think analytics and and, and embraced a new age and, and style of basketball. He's the one who went on that whole rant about Christos Porzingis and, and saying that post ups are not a good play anymore. I absolutely think that you know probably most of what Bob said resonated with him to some degree, but when it reaches a point. Where the players are like, well, you know, you're just doing this because this other guy above you said to do this, and this other guy above you has ownership ties that we don't even understand. That's that's when it reaches a, a point where you know people want to say something about it. 